Okay, good morning, everybody. It was just a great worship service. Just all the uh, verses just uh, ministering to us. And God's Spirit is really in that praise and worship. I, I just really, uh, it's such an encouragement after going through the week and coming in and hearing that the worship and praise with you, the, uh, the believers. So, anyways, uh, Pastor Steve's off today. Uh, the baton got passed to me. They had to go deep into the bench, but here I am. Uh, but I, I, actually, before I get started, I want to uh, let you know what the announcements are. So we have uh, the Return Prayer Walk in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have some members from the church I know that are going from here, but you could also participate either by, you can log into the website, it's called return.org, and uh, you can do that from home if you want. It starts at 9 a.m. You can also come to church here on Saturday, this Saturday, and from 12 to 2, uh, the church is going to be uh, showing, I think in the fellowship hall or here, live the live broadcast of the event. So that's from 12 to 2 on Saturday, September 26th. We have the Between the Bridges fundraiser that's coming up Saturday, October 17th. And uh, there'll be more details to follow on that. We will be selling tickets for that. Uh, that's usually a great time uh, with Larry Freeman and the ministry that he has for the homeless down in downtown Springfield. Trail Life Boys uh, group meetings are every Thursday, 6.30 to 8. And then the last thing is uh, prayer and praise on Tuesday evenings. Uh, from 7 to 8 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And uh, their theme is to lift God to his rightful position in our lives as Christians so that we can be effective in this crazy world. All right, so speaking of that, um, I just wanted to share for a few minutes about uh, basically what's happening in the world today and uh, what our response is as Christians, you know? How do we deal with this whole thing? What's our role? And uh, believe it or not, this isn't something that's new, you know? Uh, throughout history, there's been these upheavals and craziness that goes on. And it's usually just because of people, you know, being self-centered and the me generation and and because of the world system and uh, living apart from God and without God, this is what you get. You're re basically, you're reaping what you sow. And uh, I want to share a scripture verse before I get into the, the main uh, verse from Psalm 11. But this is Galatians 6, 7 through 10. It says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So to get back to kind of uh, where we are today with the whole world, I, I'm, we're going to look at Psalm 11. This psalm was written by David, and just to give you some background, uh, there's there was a lot of turmoil going on with him. I, I, they don't really tell us the details, but we do know that at the time they were going through a lot of shakeup, and his advisors were try, telling him one thing to do. So they're saying this is what you should do, and we'll read it in a sec. Uh, and David's response to them is Psalm 11. So they're saying, wow, there's all this upheaval and craziness going on. This is what you should do. And David's response to them is this. He says, In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, so he's talking to the advisors, flee like a bird to your mountain. For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. 
When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And it's kind of interesting because foundations in this psalm, it's a metaphor for the order of society. It's the established institutions which are the social and civil order of the community. Aren't, this, aren't those foundations today being destroyed? We see it all around us. And so what is our response as Christians? You know, I, David's gives you the answer, that first verse. What's he do? He takes his refuge in the Lord. That's the first thing we have to do. We have to go and take our refuge in, our, in the Lord. Because if we don't do that, then we're going to be unable, uh, we'll be ineffective in our, our Christian walks to really be, be able to do anything, you know? Uh, and the, we have to go to look to the Lord for our strength in these situations. So the response is, the first thing we have to do is to find our refuge in the Lord. I, I've, I know I've talked with a lot of people during this whole COVID thing and all the, uh, the rioting that's going on. And uh, to believers and non-believers. And uh, people are like, there, it seems like, I don't even want to watch the news anymore. It's just such a discouragement. And it just basically, for non-believers, it's just shaking their whole world up, you know. And, uh, but for the Christians, we have an opportunity here to take refuge in the Lord. And, and I just want to read you another psalm here. It says, um, Psalm 46, 1 through 3, it says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. It's kind of interesting because it's not like uh, when sometime when trouble might come, but it's saying in the midst of trouble, right in the midst of trouble, we're in the middle of trouble, he is our refuge and strength. Because let's face it, trouble is going to come, you know, we can't avoid it. And it also tells us that he's ever-present, you know. He doesn't sit back and wait for these things that kind of wash over us and overwhelm us, that he's ever present, always there with us. Then it goes on to say, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. I mean, I don't th think things could get any worse than that, where the whole earth falls away, the mountains are quaking from it. It's saying that even if things got that bad, you know, we won't fear because God is with us. He's our refuge. He's our strength. Underneath us are his everlasting arms to just catch us, to protect us. So that's, that's the first thing that we want to do is just take refuge in the Lord, and then we will find that we're secure. Then the second thing we need to do is to put on the full armor of God, okay? And that's in Ephesians 6. So we read, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It's not saying be strong and be powerful. It's saying be strong in the Lord, okay? Because we're weak, let's face it. Uh, we're not powerful and all that, but we know someone who is. So it's saying be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. It's interesting, and the reason why I wanted to read all through that, and I'm not going to get into the whole thing about the full armor of God because you could preach messages about that, but uh, that's something you do on your own. But the interesting thing here is four times he talk, he says stand, okay? Keep saying stand, stand fast, stand firm. And uh, so I looked up the word, and it's a military term used. And because he's talking about armor, he's, he's using a military metaphor. Stand is used... Uh, four times here. It's a military term for holding on to a position that is under attack. Okay? So we don't need to flee. We don't need to flee like a bird to the mountains. We can stand fast, even though I, the, the church may be under attack, because uh, God is, our, is going to be our strength. He doesn't say run. He doesn't say attack. He says 
because he's going to fight the battle and get the victory for us. But he wants us to stand fast. And, and, and uh, it also goes on to talk about taking up the shield of faith, which should extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. These are all the things that we're going to use to defend ourselves while we're standing fast. And it goes on to talk about the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. And I just encourage you to kind of spend some time by at another time to kind of get into the details. There's a lot in there. Um, so we need to train, really, you know, in th that whole thing. We need to find time to pray, to worship, to study God's word. These are the ways to equip ourselves so that we'll be ready to go and, and fully available for when the battle is, when we have to deal with the battle. The third thing is that we want to do, and this is where we go on the offense, okay? The third thing we want to do is to go forth with the gospel, okay? Because really, we carry the answer to the world, okay? We're the ones that have the answer. It talks about having treasures in these earthen vessels, okay? And uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have these treasures in the earth, earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So that power is there, but it's of God, not of us. What's the treasure? Well, verse 11 further on tells us that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. That treasure of Christ that dwells within us, that's what we're bringing to a broken and fallen world. So that's where we go on the offense because we have a word in season to those who are shaking and fleeing all the problems that are out there right now. And uh, we have a firm foundation. We have a wonderful counselor. What a mighty God is he, you know? So we don't need to be un under, we don't need to be afraid. The church thrives under persecution. The church thrives under persecution. I mean, if you remember in uh, the book of Acts, when the church was being persecuted in Jerusalem, uh, where they literally, people were losing their lives, it basically pushed the church out into the world. So what they meant to try to destroy caused it to thrive and grow. Okay? So the church thrives under persecution. Okay? At that time, the church got pushed out of its comfortable place. Okay? But it went out to do something that was far more greater that was all part of God's plan. So I just want to encourage you today to just Number one, find refuge in the Lord. Put on the full armor of God. Or if you want to simplify that down to the basics, put on Jesus Christ because he's all those attributes, okay? And then the last thing is just to go forth with the gospel. The good news, the answer out there for the world, okay? Amen. Father, just uh, thank you today for your precious word, Lord. And that we ask, Lord, that as Pastor Chuck comes up to speak, Lord, that you just... Uh, Use them to strengthen, encourage, and comfort your church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. It's a good word. Turn in Revelation chapter 4 is where we are. We have a meeting right after church for those that are going to D.C. Uh... We'll be leaving on the 25th. We're trying to figure out the time. We have five hotel rooms booked, but we'll cancel those we don't use. But uh, we're going. Uh, we're going to go represent you guys. I have been a Hal Lindsey man since I got saved. And I am definitely not a date setter, but I always look for a date. Because it will happen on a date, by the way, won't it? All right, we can say that. And the time is drawing nigh. And we are definitely in the days of the end of confusion and the middle of confusion we're trying to find our way into sanity and draw closer to him draw closer to the church because the only place you find that is in god's mind isn't it true not my mind god's mind and as i draw close to god he reveals that he has a plan and that i am safe and held in his hand and he knows everything in my thoughts, deep in my heart, he's prepared a way for me. For those that have courage, by the way, remember Psalm 37, the steps of a courageous man, not a good man. There really are no good men. But one thing God loves is courage, 
that overcomes the phobias and fears of life that come at him. So the steps of a courageous, valiant man are what? They're ordered. So if I want to have my life ordered by God, I've got to be what? I've got to be courageous. The church will definitely prosper in persecution, but that's the church. That's the real church. That's the mature church. That's not the what? We've learned with the seven churches that you can be a compromising church, true? So when, when trial comes, you either do what? You either stand for the truth or you compromise the truth. That's why it's so important when we read these things that we know that we're saved and we know we're on that platform of being God's and he is my beloved and I am his, that my salvation sure, that I work through the maturity levels of life, that the good news reigns in me, that I do the work of an evangelist. Why? Because that says I have good news in my life, even though there's nothing but bad news and moaning and groaning in the world, right? Moaning and groaning amongst Christians. Moaning and groaning. You know, murmuring. How do I overcome that? Good news. I hang around him who has good news. That's why the first step of being a disciple, which we're going to rewrite when we do discipleship, really is, is come away from them. Like Abraham. Be ye separate. Paul reiterates it in Corinthians, that we must be separate. Right? Come away, come out from amongst them and touch not the unclean thing and be separate, says the Lord. He said that to Abraham. You have to get away from all your opinions and really try to find out what God thinks about something. Because honestly, that's the only opinion that matters. And the closer I get to God, I have the mind of Christ. Without God, I have the mind of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you ever think about that? Which means I have a, I have a mind of creation, creation. In other words, all created things influence me. Dominate me. So I have a fear of death. Because that's part of the fall of creation. And so I am afraid. But that's not the mind of Christ, is it? I need the knowledge of Christ in my life. So perspective becomes huge. When we face chapter 4, last week we talked about the rapture, and I love that idea, and so that's really an uplifting thing, but now we're talking about judgment. There's an end of things, isn't there? And that's a sobering thought. There's an end to things. And I have to look at the perspective of God with these verses and understand Him, because we live in a, a world that we lack justice, we lack enforcement of it, we lack the laws of it, especially in this country. And why is this country significant? Because this is country, again, is the only country that was founded on the Bible. When George Washington, you know, remember the Harbingers, the first thing they did as an act of the government was they went down to a church and they kneeled and they prayed in a prayer meeting to found this nation. It was founded on the scriptures. It was found out of the Mayflower Compact, which was one of the biggest influences of a church. How to govern. And so God looks this as the melting pot, the place where all the Gentiles would come, like Israel would be the Jews. And I firmly believe that just based on what I see. And so the influence of where we are is really the influence of where the church is as a dominant in this age. And this age is characterized by what? Satan rising at where we are now. Evil prevailing. Confusion is the environment that we live in. No one knows what to believe from the people that lead us. Good, bad, or ugly. And we live in a world of phobic. This is perfect environment for what? Evil to rise. You know, in this church, we had the rugs and the, the environment for mold. When we had mold, we got to do rugs that aren't wool. But the environment for mold to grow was what? Wet, dark, and organic. Because mold only grows on organic matter. That I didn't know to a rug man told me that. We had wool rugs, Axe Mister rugs which were like $75 a yard that we took out of the old Marriott when we built this building. 
And as far as I know, wool is what? Organic, isn't it? So mold needs fuel, just like fuel needs three properties to burn a fire, right? You need air, wood, and you need spark. You need fuel, so does mold. Satan needs that too. And he rises this, this environment. And I've got to be someone that sees the environment I live in and understand it because we're constantly influenced by the world around us, aren't we? Constantly. People's opinions do influence us. And I need to be able to what? Stay in the relationship with God and be the friend of God over anybody else and stay with that and then minister to other people. And that may lose a lot of people in my life. Listen, when I got saved, I lost every friend I had. And I was pretty popular. But I didn't do the things I, you know, I've said this before, I didn't do the things I used to do. And, you know, I was kind of a, like a stick in the mud at parties now. Where I used to make parties, now I was a stick in the mud. In the mud. Because I didn't drink and smoke and go with girls that did. And so I was pretty boring. And all I wanted to do was talk about Jesus, right? Because I came out from amongst them, and I was care I was concerned for what their soul. Pilgrim's Progress mirrors that idea of evangelist, and yet his family comes and finds him later on on the way when he left his own family to escape the city of destruction. You personally have to escape the city of destruction which we live in. We live in a world also that Satan isn't some guy with a pitchfork that runs around and like in some horror movie. He is someone that wants to be good, even better than God. I will be better. I will climb up the ladder. I will show you how great I am. I want it to be sung how great I am. And so we have a system today that mirrors that, where, you know, you have criminals that are treated... Like they're not. That they're victims. I was talking, I was out to breakfast with a, a, uh, a jail a, at Summers. He was a, he's a, well, most of you know Matt and Stephanie, but they come out to trail life. Um, he was, a, he is a, what, a, what's the word? Of, he's a guard. There you go. That's the one I want. He's a guard at, at Summers. And he was telling me how horrifying it is. He goes, now they even have Xboxes in the cells. Now, don't all of you want to go to prison that can't afford an Xbox? You know, you can sit there and play video games. Don't get all excited, I. They got video games there. What a great place. Three meals a day, warm bed, video games, TV, sports. Play a little hoop, get on the baseball team. Not a bad place to live for a guy. Guys could live very well in caves as long as they got three meals a day of video game sports. They could live there. We have a system that wants to be better than God. So when you read this stuff, you've already been indoctrinated in how kind and good we need to be to people. The death penalty has basically been abolished in most places, True. And if you have the death penalty, you'll probably wait till you're ready to die to get it served to you. You'll be there for 40 years as it's appealed out and cost taxpayer millions and millions of dollars to keep you there to do what you already knew at the beginning when you were caught with a gun or a knife and you killed five people cold-handed to know what we already knew. You're going to be in jail for 40 years to wait death row. That's insane. But we call that civilized. God does it, by the way, and no one ever did in history till the last so many years. But we call it sane. God calls that kind of insane. God will have judgment, and that's not a popular thing, and it's the reason that you want to make sure that, you know what, when God comes, that you're ready. My job is to get you ready. My job is to what? get you to get a right perspective, and perspective is everything. We all talk about God. It's very easy to make God in our own image. Right? We will tell God what to do. No, you won't. Look at Isaiah before we read this chapter. Look at Isaiah 46.10. 
Uh, it's a great portion on prophecy and on God basically doing what he wants to do. Now, you think you can do what you want to do, but not without God seeing it and having consequences. Isaiah chapter 46. God wants you to remember this. So remember this today. And show yourselves men. There's a little courage. Recall to mind... O oh, you sinners, transgressors, we're definitely not worthy, as the song goes. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring, and this is a great prophecy verse that I quote a lot, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my opinion, my counsel, will stand. And I will do all my pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I also will do it. Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted who are far from righteousness. I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Amen. God will do what God wants to do. Remember who God is. He is all everything in the omnisense of power, presence. He is there in all things. He knows all things. He holds all things together. This is his creation, it isn't mine, I'm created. And I need to have a perspective of what God is doing and who he is. When we get to this, we've got to remember something, that there's an end of things, there's a beginning of things, and, and the Bible has a few major things you can boil down to. There's creation. When we get to chapter 4, we see a throne, like we said last week, but we're going to see four Five songs in chapter 4 and 5 as we begin the preparation for judgment. This is a plan for judgment. In other words, these are like battle plans before the war begins. God is going to have a plan. In the first one, he's going to, they're going to praise him. We see worship of all the beings of heaven. We see worship for creation. And the Bible starts with creation. And then we see in chapter 5, we're going to see worship for redemption. They're going to worship him for those two things. I am created by God. This is where you get your worth. I am created by God. God has died for me. And that's all I really need. Because with that, I have God. And with it, I have all that God has, which is all spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1, 3. And all acceptance in the Beloved. In 1 6, I have that. I know who I am. And in 2 6, I'm seated in heavenly places right now, the Bible says, that God knows my name and where I am, and I'm with him in heaven. Because God doesn't just have it now, he inhabits what? Eternity, doesn't he? So God has a perspective. He has created all things, and then man was given free will in the garden, and man chose, like, like uh, you know, very poorly, right? He chose the created things to listen to. Satan was created. The cherubim in Isaiah 28 that covers is one of the cherubims we'll read about in chapter 4. He was created. He fell. He drew man into fall. Whether that was simultaneous, we don't know. But we see the fall. So we know the fall is a major theme. The major theme after that becomes the redemption of the fallen. How God will lead and chose Israel to bring a seed. That starts right in 315 of the book of Genesis. That the Lord will what? Out of a woman will come a seed. And she'll bruise the one who began the whole fall. And there will be a conquering. So we know there's a redemptive plan. We are now in the idea of the end of this. God has tolerated this for seven, going on 6,000 years now and then seven 
he has tolerated this rebellion that we all take part in because of sin and the fall. He has tolerated for a long time. And you know what? He wants an end to it. He has the power to do it. But he's there to what? Reach out in his goodness and his mercy, which is one of his attributes to save the sons of men. He is long-suffering. But he's not eternally suffering, is he? So he will bring an end to this whether you like it or not. And he will bring judgment on the earth whether I like it or whether I don't like it. It has no bearing. Because he has declared the end from the beginning and he will bring it to pass. And therefore that has tremendous bearing if I have the mind of Christ on how I conduct myself in this world. How I want to go forward and touch God in my limited capacity to reach out to the world around me and even farther. It's a responsibility. And God holds his responsibility dearly and he holds me to my responsibilities. What? In his name. Because I bear his name. I'm his kid. And he wants me to be all I can be in my weakness, though I'm very weak, like Vinny said. With him with me, I am strong, right? I'm courageous. There's also a perspective of the angels. Because we think it's all about us. First of all, you've got to come out from it's all about you till it's all about us. We've got to break that barrier to everything's about me, what I want, to what? To everything's about us on the earth. It's not. You think God loves the angels? Remember, the angels fell too, a third under Satan, who was on the throne of God, covered the throne of God in Ezekiel 28. And they are heartbroken about that, by the way. They have emotions. They love God. And they, you know, are in a part are being responsible because just like this church is responsible, like any family is responsible for the entity because you're part and you influence it, so were the angels part in the fall. One third of them knew each other. One third fell. The two thirds knew them, did they not? And they have been responding to the call of redemption towards the people of, the, of God since the beginning of the plan of redemption, haven't they? They have been waging war against those that fell. We read the stories of Michael, right, with Daniel. In what? In Babylon, we read those stories, how angels fell. We have a picture of, of the rise and fall of these things all the way through the scriptures. There's a battle raging. We're not the only ones who wear the armor of God. We have angels that, what, fight for us. And this is the thing about this is you've got to remember, these angels knew nothing but the perfection of heaven and now it's like it's like you get the job assignment, okay? We've really become socialist right now. I'm going to hand out my job assignments to all of you because now we have to tell you what your working assignments are in our new economy. You've just gone ahead five years, right? So now we're going to tell you what you need to do. You're all going to work at Bondi's Island because we need workers there. How's that for a work assignment? Yeah, you can wear your mask. How's that? Won't help much, but you can wear your mask. The angels to be the ministers of fire to us. You can imagine what that horrific that is to them to see your life and the lives around you. Can I ask you a question? You think they want an end to this? You think they want an end? To following you, picking you up, covering you when you're your worst enemy? Hoping and groaning when God had died for you. Didn't die for them, did he? Giving up on God when God never gave up on you. You think the angels have a perspective in heaven? When we get into these portions about the judgments of God and the plans of God, the angels will take the major role of judgment through the tribulation. They'll be dishing it out from the top 
of the cherubims. They'll open the seals, by the way. They'll get the seals and what? Begin them with the, with the four horsemen come four cherubims that bring out the horses. Very significant since Satan himself was a cherubim. Very significant of the humility of the cherubims not to even look at the Lord and cover it. But I can imagine their humility because one of their own of the top ranking angels fell and started the whole mess. It's like hell came from your household. And you feel a little responsible about that. He was the one that covered and now everything is laid what? Bare. And so they are the ones that will what? bow before the throne and they are the ones the highest angels the highest form of life in heaven created they are the ones that don't pick up their heads before God but they are the ones that will dish out the beginning judgments of God and then angels too so let's read here and we'll try to exegete this and get to worthy as the lamb that was slain God's perspective he is lifted up we talked last week about this being the rapture, but I don't know if the church is here. I have listened to people say they are here. I don't know if we are there. John's there. 24 elders will be there, but let's read and we'll explain this. He looked up and he saw a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the things that much take place. We talked last week about that sign of the trumpet and the voice meaning the rapture, and I believe in the rapture of the church before judgment comes. Immediately he's changed, and behold, a throne is set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. Now this is a picture of the Father, the triune God we're going to look at here. If you want evidence for the Trinity, uh, 4 and 5 of Revelation clearly give the idea of this in the throne. God the Father is there, remember. All things at the end will be given over to the Father. Jesus said, me and my Father are one. So we have a triune God in complete unity and oneness with all three parts and all three persons. He's in the Spirit. He's at the throne. And this is about the throne. The throne brings order, by the way. The throne is ruling, isn't it? In other words, God's got this in control, whether it looks like it or not. God is bearing this. It looks like a mess, but life will come out of it and life more abundantly, won't it? I mean, you can look at your life. Many times it looks like a mess, right? But be still. God's got a plan. If you're ever in the place to watch a baby be born, it's a mess. It's a complete holocaust. You know, that's why I pray men stay outside. But you know what? They wouldn't let me stay outside because today we're very bad men if we stay outside. I didn't think my father was bad when he sat in the lobby. But you know what? It is a mess. It is bloody. It is painful. And But out of that comes, and Jesus talked about that, joy comes, doesn't it? When the baby is born, all the tears fall away, don't they? And joy comes in the birth of a life. He who sat on the throne was like Jasper and a Sardis stone. These are the two stones of the uh, beginning and end of the ephod of the high priest. They're also clear like a diamond. They sparkle and they enhance what is there. They just illuminate. There was a rainbow around the throne. Its appearance was like an emerald. This must be a cool rainbow. I, I'm a rainbow chaser when I see him. Uh, you know, I, this is an emerald rainbow of God around his throne. Uh, just like the rainbows we have, this is one over the throne of God. It speaks of life. Everything God does. Listen, in the middle of judgment, everything God does is life. For life. During the tribulation, God doesn't withhold his mercy and his grace. He's trying to crack hard rocks. You know, we've said this before. 
If a, if, if a small sledgehammer won't do, get a bigger sledgehammer, right? There are hard, stubborn people. We're all hard and stubborn. And you know what? He's trying to break the hearts of people and thousands and millions will get saved. Remember, the population of the earth is going on 8 billion. There'll be millions and millions of people that will come to Christ. They've got 144,000 evangelists, Billy Graham's out in all the world preaching, and people will come to Christ. They might die because they came to Christ, but let me tell you something. If Christ is real, you don't care if you die. You already know you're going to die. If Christ is real to you, you can embrace martyrdom because you know the best is yet to come. If Christ isn't real to you, you fear keeping yourself alive. Now, that doesn't mean you're suicidal. There's the balance. There's always balance. It doesn't mean I'm suicidal. I don't want to run you know, into a car to go to heaven. It means that I'm going to serve God, and when God wants me, I'm going home, and I'm not going to stay on the earth any longer. And if he wants me to be martyred, then I know he'll go with me to the martyrdom. And the pay will be tremendous. True. But I'm not going to deny him. Why? Because he's real. And I know I'm saved. And I know I'm only passing through and I know he has a plan. I'm going to stay with his plan, not mine. Don't make plans for yourself. Find God's plan for your life. An emerald one of life, and there's always life. His hand is always stretched out. You know, his hand is stretched out like the key theme of Isaiah. Even in the tribulation, his hand is stretched out. Even as he's letting wrath be poured out on the earth. And the angels are dispensing it, by the way. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns. Stephanus, the crown of a conqueror, and gold on their heads. Now, this is in, in like, who are these people? The Bible doesn't give us a clear answer. But when we go to the mind of God, which is comparing Scripture and Scripture, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what do we find out? Well, who wears white in heaven? The saints, right? Right? The saints. They had to pass through the Bema seat to get the conquering crowd. In other words, they had to be human. They had to pass through overcoming. And they had to get the conquering crown of the Stephanias. The diadem is what Jesus has. That's the all-conquering ruling one. But this word here is for conqueror. And these are supreme overcomers that in the church age, somehow, the best theological answer you can give is they overcame and they were exceptional. They were like Paul. I'm sure Paul's in this group, right? John's going to be in this group. John may see himself, for all I know, or sit down in his throne. They're all there. They mostly all laid down their lives and died. Or died daily. But they're all there around the throne of God. And they all have crowns. And they're all reigning elders of the church. And they're there. Then he goes on, and from the throne proceeded lightning and thunderings and voices, and lamps on fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, before the throne, the seven spirits, it includes the Holy Spirit here. Um, you know, we're going to take on that Jesus is there because, too, because the idea, if you see the Father, you see me, and of course, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit beyond measure, right? But he's not introduced here in power and who he is in humanity to chapter 5. We'll find that out next week. That's when he's a lamb. But he was part of creation as we sing about creation here, right? Nothing was made without him. And by him all things were made. And in Colossians, what? 1.16, it says, by him all things do what? Consist, don't they? So he was in creation with God. We know that from John 1, 1, don't we? So part of this song is about him, but redemption is about all him, isn't it? He's the God-man. That's why I can come boldly, because he was man and he knows me. And he can identify. That's the great, great worthiness of the Godhead, that he is in the midst of it. 
representing me as an advocate for me. So here we see this throne. This throne is all about thunderings. Now, what do those represent in the scripture? Where do we hear thunderings and lightnings in the scriptures? Anybody know? Well, we found that at Mount Zion, right? At Mount Sinai, not Mount Zion. When they came to Zion, they didn't want to go near the mountain because it trembled with lightning and thunders. And so they were sorely afraid. They said, Moses, you go talk to him. I ain't talking to him. This was about judgment, isn't it? This is about the law is what? The rule of judgment. And God sits on a throne, and now he's not on the throne of grace anymore. Remember where you can go to right now, and that's why there's hope right now for all of us to be the best we can be in the world we're facing. Right now, you can go in Hebrews 4.16 to the throne of grace, and you can obtain mercy, which everyone needs because you're a sinner. But I also can find grace. Mercy is the same for every one of you, the blood of Christ, right? But you need grace for your own life, for the season of life you're in, right? For the attitude you're facing in the world around you to deal with the problems of this world, the government's, the job you're in, whatever it is, the role you play, I need grace, what? To strengthen me and make me strong in him to do what God calls me to do. And so we have a call to find that out now, but this is the end. The church is gone. This is heaven finally saying the end. Now, none of us want to go to judgment, but heaven is rooting for judgment. They're like, done. You get that? The angels that are taking care of you right now, they're not there anymore taking care of you. They're in heaven. You know what they're saying? Thank God it's over. It's like working, a, a, you know, for you, like it's working like a uh, 6,000 year shutdown. <laughs> Nonstop. The job is over. We're done. Now let's end it. This is a fit end. There are thrones. The Holy Spirit is here. Before the throne was a sea of glass, a crystal. This is a reflecting idea. It's not a sea, but it is like glass that is crystal and reflects. This is the brightest you can imagine with God. In the midst of the throne and around the throne are the four creatures full of eyes in front and back. These are like the record keeper. They're not uh, creatures. They are beings that God has made on the high, high rank. In my own idea of reading this, and many different people reading it, no one has an explanation. I believe they are the witnesses of God because they are the main perspective of like seeing all things. No one's omnipresent but God. In other words, if I say, listen, I know all about you. I can read your heart. Does anybody else read my heart to tell me you're right? These beans do. They have given the, the power and the privilege to have eyes encased with eyes to see everything that goes on and to see deep into everything that is. Because why? God doesn't establish anything without a witness, does he? That's why there's books in our imagination. There's books. But God says books will be open. Right? They write down, they back up what God sees already because he's God. They've been created to back up the files. They are your backup files on God's judgment that you ain't, you can say, uh, you know what? Oh, I never did that, God. You're a liar. Oh, really? What do you guys? Did he do that? Here it is. Here it is. Did he think that? Here it is. Here it is. Because God is completely about eyewitnessing things, by the way. It's not going to be some kind of crazy mock trial. Did you really see it? Thank. Thank. Yeah, I did. Did he really do it? Thank. Thank. That's why, you know what? This is the age. There's no conning with God. There's no religiosity of hypocrisy that God can't see or smell. This is the age to be clean with God. This is the age to see how much he loves you. 
This is the age to transform yourself through the Holy Spirit in the one. Someone pleasing to him who has courage for the age you live in. Not fear. If you've got fear, you need to listen. Please, if you've got fear, you need to get rid of it. Am I telling you to be stupid? No, I'm telling you to get rid of fear. It will do you no good. And God will hold you to that, by the way. God wonders why you're afraid. Do you understand? You, okay. I hope you put yourself in a personal like idea. It's like when you don't believe in God, it's like, like saying, I don't trust you to somebody that loves you and died for you. That hurts God, by the way. Wouldn't that hurt you? I died on a cross for you. Yeah, but I still don't trust you. Not with my life. <laughs> You can do what you want, but not with my life. Or you know what? I, 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 you know, I just don't see it. I don't believe in what you're saying. Whatever it is, you don't have faith. Or when you live in fear, what's that mean? You don't trust God. Am I saying don't be cautious? No. I'm saying if phobia rules your life, God does it. Isn't that clear? Right. I like that Catholic preacher. I got flacked by a, a new Catholic the other day. And it was like the Catholic priest that, 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 that is on our website or on Facebook, if you can see it. When he got up and, and, and he said, he's got tons of flack, but I love his courage. He got up and said, if you're, ca if you're Catholic, you can't be a Democrat. Now, we don't preach any party here, but we do. He had one great statement. I've said it before. He's talked about morality. The church should be a moral influence to do politics, right? They should call out people that are immoral. And he went back on the idea of God's perspective. You can't be someone who says you know God, right? And not serve God because you have to know and love God to serve God. We said this last week, but you have to think how he thinks. How can you do what God hates and say you know God? He is the judge of all the earth. Doesn't that scare the bejeebers out of you? How could you be for killing 60 million or 60 million babies and say you have no fear in that and that's right to do when God hates that? Now, you may have had an abortion. You may be influenced by people that had. But that we're talking right now. You need to repent and say, I'm for life. I was wrong. I've been wrong most of my life. I want to be right. And God has an emerald throne that speaks life and life more abundantly. And man is the crown of his creation. And we can't play God. God can take a baby home. You know, the argument of the idea of of miscarriage well why can't we have abortion because you're not god that's why god's god and he can do what he wants but you can't right so we need to really see god in who he is and that he is what moral and when I make God immoral, which is the age we live in liberalism, while well, everybody can do what they want and it's mean to tell them they can't, well, God will tell you you can't all day long because he didn't make it that way, right? He didn't make all the rights we have for everything. Because when I take liberty to an extreme, I make it what? Ridiculous. And I destroy liberty by taking it to extremes. Because the social fabric will come back on me. True? If I legalize drugs, then you know what? That, I, I don't do drugs, but that will come back on me and my taxes, won't it? Also in the crime that I have to get a dog and an alarm for my house. Also that I need for the first time in my life to have a gun. Because the police are mean because they enforce the law. You see how this goes? But I don't do anything wrong. The wrong's coming at you. And God's going to put an end to it. And we need to think through our own lives and the lives around us. There's a sea of glass there and the throne of the four living creatures with eyes. And they are the witnesses of God because they see all things. The first living creature was like a lion. The second creature like a calf. The third 
living creature had the face of a man. The fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now, I have no idea what these mean. I know Ezekiel saw this vision. All four had all four faces in Ezekiel chapter 1. You can read that. Isaiah saw the, th the throne of God. He didn't mention these, but he was focused on the Lord on the throne. His train filled the temple. Paul was taken up to heaven, but he wasn't permitted to speak what he saw. He had words unutterable that he saw. But here this coincides with uh, many scriptures uh, in the idea of what he sees here. And I have no idea what they mean. They, we know the four books of the Gospels all have these as the animal heads. We know we have the king or we have what speaks of what? The lion of the tribe of Judah in Matthew. We know we have the bull or the ox or the calf here signifying the book of Mark. We know that because Mark's about the servanthood of man. We know we have Luke, who's the son of man, right? It's all about the son of man. Well, we have a man here. And we also know we have an eagle, which pictures the throne of God, which is what? The son of God. So we have all those in the Gospels of who God is. But we have these here, and God knows what they are and what they do. But these are the living creatures and they have within six wings and these are our cherubims and they have the living creatures and they have six wings and they're full of eyes around within and they do not they do not rest day and night until they say what holy 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 lord god almighty who was and is and is to come this title why i say jesus is here we see it in this that he is called the one who is the one who was and is and is to come in chapter 1 of Revelation. So we see the Lord here. We see him in the next chapter in full what his role is as Redeemer. But here we see him on the throne of God as part of creation with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we see the triple salutation which Isaiah heard in heaven, holy, 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 holy. Why is that important? It brings continuity to the Bible because God backs up this statement. It wasn't made up by somebody's mind who got a golden glasses and a golden candlestick to write something new. It has continuity from ages past, which gives it what? Validity today. And when he extrapolates on this into more detail, we have a foundation that this was always in the mind of God. Because one of the key things of judgment isn't just found here, but the punishment of the wicked is all the way through the Old Testament. And the new, isn't it? This isn't some new doctrine, judgment. It's all the way through. These are creatures that worship God. And we see another major theme here in heaven. What does he see? Worship. 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 In heaven. This isn't boring. This is thankfulness. This is unbelievable. We have so many things to stimulate ourselves that the deepest stimulation of our lives really is worship. The deepest ecstasies are worship. And this is to worship someone who is worthy. Now, when we talk about judgment here, remember, I don't even know if the church is here. Because when I read chapter 4 and 5, we assume it's there. But we might be at the, you know, in meditating on this and listening to the scholars... We might be in the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know? If I go to battle, I don't bring my wife and my, my daughters with me. Do you? Maybe Israel does, but I don't. These guys are getting ready to go to war, aren't they? They're going to lay out in chapter five, uh, 5 the beginning of the opening of the plan book that was written before the foundations of the world to judge the world. They're going to open up the book. And 24 elders are here, and these guys are mature, but you know what? I don't know if the church is here. We might be in a marriage feast. We don't judge believers, do we? In fact, Paul says, you know what? You'll judge angels. He doesn't say anything about believers, does he? I don't want to judge people on the earth. I know them. There's no reference in the Bible about you judging mankind. 
We might see the judgment, but we're not going to be part of it, nor are we part of bringing the judgment in tribulation here. Isn't that good? Even in, in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back on a white horse, he's, he's dipped in blood. What are you wearing? White robes. And by the way, he emphasized, very clean. Now, no one in their right mind would send me into a battle with a white robe. Very clean. We are called to live. Corinthians, Paul talks about we live in the Lord's triumph. We're conquerors in the Lord's triumph. You know what that means? That means we, we follow in the great procession of his victory. With a rear guard. We don't even have to get dirty. How, what kind of fight is there? He opens his mouth and the sword comes out and kills everybody. I don't have to get myself dirty at all, do I? I just have to follow my beloved and know he's just. And maybe seven years is him saying and us getting to know him how just and merciful he is because he's coming back to kill people on the earth that you may know. I'm just thankful I'm not there. And I get to reveal all the chances. He reveals all the chances and his mercy and his love he's done for everybody. And his hand stretched out and his hand knocking and the Holy Spirit revealing and wooing and the Father drawing. And we get to see all that. And we're like, hallelujah. God, you've done everything you could. What more can you do? But you're my beloved. You're the lover of my soul. And so I get to see him for these years at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I get to see him and know him. And I don't even know if I'm there. I really don't want to be part of this, do you? I don't want to be in the tribulation, nor do I want to be part of the wrath of the tribulation, do you? It's more like, honey, stay at the dinner. I'll be back in a few minutes. Right? Send the angels out. They're the ones who distribute the wrath of God, by the way. And they're ready to, by the way. They're more than ready to. And so at the end of this, we see this is the first salutation. There's five. Again, there's two here of creation. And then there's two in the next chapter of redemption. Verse 19, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders do what? They fall down before him who sits on the throne. They worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Love that verse. Love the music of casting crowns. Love the idea. But it says they do. It doesn't even say we'll be there. I think I might cast my crown. If I have one, I want to cast it. But it may not be at this time. And they sing a song which we sing with such greatness. Thou art worthy. You are worthy, O Lord. To receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by you they exist and were created. This is a great worship. The idea that he is worthy to do what he wants to do. Remember when we close with this right now. That we have a God who is worthy. What's that mean? There is no God like him. We read in Isaiah. He declares the end from the beginning. But he is also worthy. In other words, he has earned the right to be worthy. It's where we put weight on something and evaluate it that no one is, is worthy to do. No one can do this in the next chapter, but only you could do it. Why? Because you earned the right to do it. You get that? Most gods will say, you know, you worship Allah. He made the creation. That's great. He deserves worship. But God is worthy throughout his plan, not just the beginning, not just the beginning of his plan is worthy. He created all things, but the redemption and the follow up all the way through that he has what redeemed it and is redeeming it and will end it that he died for it. In other words, why is God worthy to be worshipped? Because he died for me. True. 
He's worthy for me to obey. I don't just worship God because He exists and things exist. I worship because He cares. That He wants me to grow. That He wants me to know. The two go together. And He wants me to come out and get His perspective. Listen, this is all about perspective. When you're in heaven, you'll have the full perspective, won't you? You'll be talking to angels, won't you? Again, you know how you get perspective? What's the full side? What's the story? What's the real? What's your perspective of it? Oh, I never heard your side of the story. Yeah, I followed your tired butt around since you were born. I'm glad it's over. Right? Angels just get into heaven like we get in. We're flying up with the Lord. They just fall into heaven exhausted, right? God, I'm glad that's over. We're like going to the marriage supper. Hey, how you doing? Hey, we're all there. They're all like panting in heaven like, God, thank God we don't have to do that again. And then we're going to arm up and we're going to go to battle and end this thing finally. Perspective. They worship God because they didn't fall too. And they lost a third of their family of angels in the fall, by the way, right? There's a lot about perspective. There's a lot about coming out amongst influences of people to tell you, well, if I was God, you ever hear that one? You ever say that one? Well, if I was God, I wouldn't do it that way. If I was God, I wouldn't judge anybody. Well, you like justice? Yeah, justice, you have to judge, don't you? Thank God you're not God. Thank God I'm not God. God will end this, and we need to be people that implore people to come to Christ. The world needs to know there's good news out there. Hello? The world needs to know there's good news out there. You need to live in the good news. All the time. Not sometimes. All the time. We need to declare the good news to people. We can't save anybody, but we can lead people to the Savior, right? You know? People can want you see we should be like the book of Acts like the drunkards right in the book of Acts 2 where they were like drunk They said my god these men are drunk. No, we're not drunk We're filled with the Spirit of God And we've got great news Christ rose from the dead And he loves us And the redemption of Israel has come right True But that's got to be real And it's only real if you maintain it, by the way. Right? You've got to stir yourself up like Timothy did and maintain it. I think a couple of us are going on outreach today down uh, in Springfield. Anybody see Pastor Eddie? But uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for this country, Lord, for this world we live in, for the gates of heaven, Lord, that are so tired of all this nonsense and yet permit it still. We pray in the midst of it, Lord, that you would draw men to yourself. Use us as you would use us. Give us courage, Lord, to overcome. We pray, Lord, that these be the best days of our life with the best yet to come. So, Lord, strengthen your churches, Lord, wherever they may be today. Strengthen your people for the end to come. We love you. We praise you. We look for you. And, Lord, we say come. And so we give you this service. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You're dismissed. I need a meeting with everybody going to D.C. in the back after this. But God bless you guys. Tell somebody you love them, all right? Tell somebody unsaved that God loves them, too. We'll add.